Hello, my name's Mark Hill, and I'm an accredited lecturer of the Art Society. But for the past 23 years, I've been working with art, antiques and collectibles. And I guess over those 23 years, I've pretty much done everything you can do if you work in that sort of business. So I started off working in auction houses at Sotheby's and Bonhams. And I then moved into the dot-com world, starting to take antiques online, what seems like a million years ago now in, in the year 2000. And I also worked with publishing as well. So I worked with Judith Miller on the Miller's Price Guides and, and range of books. And in 2006, I founded my own company and I research, write and have published 12 books on new areas of uh, 20th century design and the decorative arts. And I suppose at the core of those, my real passion is for glass and most of the books I've written um, are, are on glass. And as I look around my room here, um, I can see many hundreds of different pieces of glass in my collection. But I've picked two to talk about today. Um, these pieces here which I think for me sum up um, one of the most exciting periods um, in glass in the 20th century, and that is really the 1960s. So much changes in the 1960s. Um, and I think these two objects really show both sides or both of the most important sides to those. They're both linked in a way because although they're very, very different pieces of glass, they were both made in 1967. So what do we have here? What are my two pieces of glass? Well, the first is, is instantly recognisable from these very characteristic discs on the stem here. And it's the Sheringham candle holder, designed by Ronald Stennett Wilson in 1967 and made by King's Lynn glass, which was later known as Wedgwood glass during the late 1960s and into the 1970s. And for me, it represents a lot of the themes behind the great changes that British factory glass underwent during that period. The second piece is, is very, very different, and it's this ovoid, almost sort of pebble-like form. There is a little hole in the top, but I think it's more sculptural than functional. And it's a very early example of studio glass. And this example was made by a glass artist called Sam Herman, and it's signed and dated Samuel J. Herman 1967 on the base. So I use two terms there that perhaps require a little explanation. So the first is factory glass, um, and that is very much like it sounds. So it was glass produced in a factory. So a designer would come up with a design, pass it on to glass makers working in a factory, and it would be produced in quantities sort of ranging from small ranges or limited editions, all the way up to mass production over many years. The sorts of things you might find in your kitchen cupboard and drink a glass of wine or a gin and tonic out of or something. Studio glass requires a little bit more explanation. Um, you know when you drive down to sort of Devon or Cornwall or something and you see uh, a sign nailed into a tree down a country lane and it says pottery. So you take a turn and you go down a bumpy road with potholes in it and then you come across a little cottage or a barn or something and someone inside is producing pottery. Um, so they are both the designer and the maker. They may be assisted by someone in their family or a small team, but the designer, the artist, is actually getting their hands on the material and actually making the product themselves. So it's very different from factory glass, very, very different indeed. Studio glass, one might think, um, has been around forever and certainly people had experimented with producing glass on a small scale um, and with the artist and the designer actually handling the material themselves. But it wasn't until the 1960s that it really took off. And the reasons are quite simple. So a glass designer coming up with a design um, would have to take it to a factory to be made simply because glass is an extremely expensive and difficult material to use. Um, for a start, you need a furnace. So the furnace has to heat the glass to incredibly hot temperatures. Um, and you can't turn a furnace on and off like you do with a sort of um, a kitchen oven or something when you cook the Sunday roast. It has to be on 24-7, 365 days a year. That takes a lot of fuel. And it also takes a lot of fuel to actually bring the furnace up to temperature to enable the glass and the other uh, ingredients to make a glass batch to actually melt into that ductile bright orange material that you see. So with that, you tended to need great big buildings to keep it all in, as well as the raw materials being constantly brought in to keep it going. Um, if you've been to the West Midlands, um, a town like Stourbridge, for example, you might have seen those very large brick cones. Well, they're glass cones, and that's where most glass was made before it was moved into factories. 
So it was expensive, time consuming, and required a lot of materials and a special building to, to do it in. So really you couldn't melt glass anywhere else, really. It had to be melted at a factory or at a glass cone. The other angle to studio glass is the fact that um, you couldn't just go to a college um, anywhere across the country and learn how to make glass. It was very much a sort of a closed industry. So you would have to approach a factory, probably as a young person, um, and you might start sweeping the floors or, or doing other sort of menial tasks. If in a glass making team a position opened up, you might be able to go and learn how to gather the hot glass out of the furnace to pass to the glass maker. And then it's a little bit like dead man's shoes, I suppose. As opportunities opened up further up the ladder and your skill base built up and your experience built up, you would be able to move until maybe some years later you actually do become um, a fully fledged, experienced and skilled glass maker. So back to the 1960s when these two pieces of glass were made. And I want to start with um, this piece here, which is the Sheringham Candle Holder designed by Ronald Stennett Wilson. Um, and as you'll notice, it's very obviously coloured, and it's also in a sort of very modern, avant-garde and progressive form with these very recognisable discs, and then this holder here to put the tea light candle in. So I think it's fair to say that um, up until the, the, the First World War, and indeed just after the First World War, we were by and large as a nation relatively sort of conservative and staid. We liked what was trusted, we were relatively traditional, and in terms of glass, that by and large meant um, sort of colourless glass covered with cuts. Sometimes I call it death by a thousand cuts, and you'll, you'll know the type of glass I mean. It sort of sparkles in the light and on a dinner table, and it's very beautiful and fabulous quality, but it's, it's covered all over with these very Victorian mitre, oval or star-shaped cuts. It's a particular look, it's very traditional and ultimately it has its roots in Georgian and Victorian glass. So it stays the same all the way through from the 19, into the 1930s and 1950s. More modern coloured glass was produced. Um, Whitefriars, for example, Powell and Sons produced what I call fast fashion glass in Venetian styles. Um, and, and also in sort of swirls and mottles and clouds. Um, you see Monart up in Scotland. Um, they produced similar glass with sort of swirls in, in colours and, and mottles and cloudy patterns inside. But there wasn't really anything new that was taken on by and large by a larger group of people, or anything very progressive, until the 1950s when we suddenly see this enormous influence from Scandinavia in terms of modern glass suddenly colour is injected into the palette and you end up with these wonderful clean line modern forms. Murano glass produced on Italy also has an enormous influence on us at the time. So after the war, as things start to pick up during the 1960s, we see this acceleration in glass design and suddenly an injection, a riot of a rainbow of colours being introduced on very, very modern looking forms. One of the innovators and pioneers of introducing this new style of glass into the UK was Ronald Stennett Wilson, who designed the Sheringham candle holder that I have here. So he was an interesting chap. So he was born in 1915 and his first job was working for a company called Rybeck and Nordstrom, who imported and distributed Scandinavian glass. After the war, he joined another company, Weed Arts, who did exactly the same thing. And whilst at Weed Art, he decided to start designing his own glass, so he was able to see and understand Scandinavian glass design and also see and understand what it was that the British public were buying. So he kind of combined those to produce his own designs, which were made in Scandinavia and sold in the UK, but designed by him. He takes things a little step further, designing a range of brightly coloured uh, glasses, drinking glasses, for a company called Leamington, who are best known for their light bulbs. And in 1960, he explores a little differently by opening up his own shop, selling Scandinavian glass um, in Hampstead, in London. By 1961, he's become quite experienced in this. He's tasted design, he's seen import, he's seen sales, and he's seen successes and probably calamitous failures too. But whatever his knowledge and experience has built up, and he is appointed reader in glass at the Royal College of Art in London. So whilst teaching new generations of glass designers there, he also continues to design, but he tends to find that glass makers in the UK still don't necessarily want to make the modern glass, the innovative, progressive modern glass that's being imported from Scandinavia and Italy. They're still sort of stuck in their traditional ways, I suppose. So in 1967, he takes a huge risk. 
he leaves the Royal College of Art and he founds his own company, Kings Lynn Glass in Norfolk. Um, and in 1967, he produced obviously a huge range, a very wide range of different products, including the Sheringham candlestick that we have here. Two years later, his company is acquired by Wedgwood, the uh, renowned historic ceramics company. They start to see what's happening with glass. They start to see that by the 60s, the British public are, are buying it at increasing quantities and they want to have a little bit of that market. And I think we should just pause there for a moment because we're all sort of familiar these days with reading about um, some enormous dot com like Google swallowing up another small dot com that had founded itself or been founded you know, several months or a year or two years beforehand. Hand. But back in the 1960s, to found a company and then sell it to such an important, key, historic name as Wedgwood really was an enormous achievement. And his company was very successful. Wedgwood Glass sold right the way in through to the 1980s. Many, many different designs were produced, including the Brancaster and a series of very modern, brightly coloured vases and bowls. So let's return to the object itself. Stenwick Wilson's Sheringham Candle Holder, designed in 1967. And as you can see, I, th I think you'll agree that it's about as different um, and as far away from traditional Victorian death by a thousand cuts, colourless glass you can get. It's in a strong, vibrant blue um, and it's a very modern form, a very geometric form in this case. So it sort of bears a lot of the hallmarks of the styles that you see coming out of Scandinavia and, and, and from Murano at the time. It looks as if it's relatively simple to make with its very strong geometric lines. And actually it's incredibly difficult to make. When you consider that each and every piece, each and every component is a separate gather of glass that the glass maker has to come together and pull together and work together. When you look at the consistency of size and the straightness of the form, you really begin to understand how hard that would be to make out of this ductile molten material. And then consider that this isn't the largest size. So they produced them with, with one disc, so a little shorter than this, but all the way up to sort of eight or nine discs as well. So when you consider the size and the straightness and the consistency of, of the larger pieces, you really begin to understand the skill required to make them. But it is what it is. It is very much a mid-century uh, modern design that reflects the progressive and innovative styles influenced by Scandinavia and Murano of the time and how they affected British factory glass. So let's get back to studio glass and the second piece I have here that was made in 1967, the pebble form vase made by Sam Herman. So I have already explained that most glass needed to be made in factories. Um, and that therefore the artist or the designer wasn't able to work directly with the medium itself, therefore sort of giving form to their creative expression. I mean, I suppose an easy way to think about it is to um, think of Picasso not actually being able to apply paint with brushes onto the palette and then onto the canvas. He had to get someone else to do it. That's probably an easy way to understand it. Um, well, all that changed in the early 1960s at the University of Wisconsin in America. There, a technician and ceramicists called um, Harvey Littleton and Dominic Labino worked out a way for glass to be produced outside of a factory environment. They designed a small furnace where you could melt the glass, and they also designed a glass formula that would melt at a much lower temperature. Immediately, the artist was able to work direct with glass, um, perhaps even in a large garden shed, but in this instance, within the newly formed glass department at the University of Wisconsin. In the same year, in 1962, one of the new students who joined the university to study was Sam Herman. So he had studied anthropology and sociology before and had enrolled to do something entirely different at the time and worked with sculpture. So he learned about what Littleton and Labino had produced and his interest was piqued, so he signed up to do the new glass course. Well, it changed his life. As his skills grew and as he began to understand glass, his experience in sculpture and in anthropology start to come through and he starts to use glass as a medium for art. And I think that's a key step here as well. We think of paint or bronze or limestone or wood or graphite pencil as being the sort of media that you would use for making art. Um, even pottery began to be used. But to actually produce glass art was still a relatively new thing. 
1965, his skills are great enough and his understanding of these new studio glass techniques are great enough and he wins a Fulbright scholarship. He comes to England and starts off uh, at, the, at the Edinburgh College of Art in Scotland, where he works with Helen Munro Turno, a very well-known and very skilled glass engraver and glass designer. Whilst he's there with Turner explaining these new techniques and learning how to engrave and cut glass, he, the college is visited by David the Marquis of Queensbury, who's very senior at the Royal College of Art in London. His mind is blown by what he's shown by Sam, and he begins to understand what the studio glass techniques mean and what the potential behind it is. So he invites Sam Herman to come down to the Royal College of Art and accept a research fellowship, which he does in 1966. He arrives at the Royal College of Art, starts working at the department and introduces the Royal College of Art's industrial glass department to studio glass techniques. Of course, it blows people's minds and suddenly they start to understand the artistic applications to glass and also the fact that glass designers can start to handle the medium themselves. In 1967, he's appointed tutor and he remains tutor until 1974. And he starts to introduce wave after wave after wave of new studio glass artists and new glass artists to the world as they come through the glass department and graduate. By sort of 1968-1969, he's beginning to ask himself, but once he's tutored these people, educated them, brought out their artistic uh, aesthetic in glass, what do they do next? It's still expensive to run a glass furnace, and then you also have to market your work. So he co-founds something called the Glass House in Covent Garden in London, and it was quite a unique um, format. The Glass House contained in the back glass furnaces, which you could rent by the hour. So the glass student, the glass artist could go in and rent the furnace for a couple of hours and produce their work. And then at the front of the glass house, there was a gallery to sell the glass and to market it. So it effectively enabled new artists coming out of college and coming out of the Royal College of Art, um, having graduated in glass design um, and, and, and glass production, to have a market for their work and to be able to progress their careers. But Sam doesn't just nurture and tutor and support these new waves of, uh, of glassmakers and glass artists. He also continuously develops his own style, his own artistic abilities and his own artistic direction. And he develops it to the extent that in 1971, he's invited to have an exhibition at the Victoria and Albert Museum. So let us think about that for a moment, because here's a man who, not a decade before, had come across new ways of handling material, which he had no experience in. And less than a decade later, he's invited by one of the world's most renowned museums to have an exhibition of his work. It's a remarkable achievement, a, a, an absolutely incredible achievement. So this, combined with his increased lecturing both in London and across the world, begins to draw attention. He's holding exhibitions all over the world, he's promoting new studio glass techniques across the world, and of course there's this incredible exhibition at the Victoria and Albert Museum. In 1974, the South Australian government see what he's done with the glass house, see what he's done across the world. They understand what happened at the exhibition at the Victoria and Albert Museum, and they see what he's done at the Royal College of Art. And they invite him to come to South Australia to set up a similar facility to the glass house at the jam factory. And it's called the Jam Factory because it literally was a factory where they made jam that had then closed down. And it became, I suppose, what we would now call a creative hub. So there were designers, uh, ceramicists, uh, textile designers, and then outside the main brick built building was a large shed where Sam had his new glass department. And from there he created sort of fireworks, a, a volcano of creativity as he taught new waves of glass artists and glassmakers these new techniques. And he didn't just do that in Australia, he did it in many countries across the world. And I think for that reason, we have to see Sam as one of the founding forefathers of the studio glass movement. Without him, without his understanding, without his expertise and his artistic ability, and without him tutoring so many people across the world and promoting these new techniques, we would not have the vibrant studio glass industry that we have today, with independent individuals all over the world producing incredibly complex designs, pushing the boundaries of 
what you can do with glass and using glass very much as an art. Now let's go back to my piece made in 1967 by Sam. So as you can see it is relatively rudimentary. It's got a wonderfully tactile sort of pebble-like form to it but it's very clear 1967 Sam is still learning how to manipulate this magical mercurial material. He's also learning how to make the glass itself. It's I suppose in some ways a bit like baking a cake. If you don't get the right ingredients the cake isn't going to work out right and then in this instance Instance, it's the same with glass. The glass won't work out quite right. And if you look very closely on this example, you'll see that it's filled with lots of little tiny bubbles, which we call seeds. And that shows that perhaps the mixture in this instance wasn't quite right. Sam nevertheless improved dramatically and his work over the next few years really began to focus on a number of angles and aspects. So his, his interest in anthropology for his first degree I think comes to the fore. So some of his forms explore the human body, particularly the torso, and you can see that in some of his stylized forms. He also looks at posturing, the way we stand as well, the way we move, what shape are we? But he looks as well at, um, at sort of more core themes as well. So sometimes he doesn't look at the human body, the torso or posturing. He's just exploring colour and what you can do with colour and how that works with glass. Glass is very different from ceramics, of course. For a start, you can see through it, but it's a very different material. So he explores almost like a painter. Uh, the, the, the techniques of glass and what you can do with that. He also looks at the, the material itself. So Sam's glass is very, very glassy. It's not trying to be something else. If you go back to my death by a thousand cuts Victorian glass, it's very rigid, it's very angular. It's got man putting man into the glass, making the material do something that it isn't. Glass wants to be sort of rounded and amorphous in its own right. And Sam really explores the glassiness of glass itself. He's now a world-renowned artist. Um, and you can see his work in many, many major museums, including, of course, the Victoria and Albert Museum. So there we are, two very different pieces of glass by very different people, both made in 1967 and both representing two very different angles of the revolutionary changes that went on during the 1960s in British glass design. Firstly, we have Ronald Stennett Wilson's Sheringham candle holder with that sort of injection of colour um, and transformation of form into something much, much more modern than traditional cut glass. And then we have Sam Herman's studio glass vase, which shows a sort of seismic shift and the effects of the discoveries um, of, 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 of glass being able to be made in a small furnace and the artist being able to handle glass directly, thereby transforming glass into a form of art. Thank you very much for listening to me. I hope you've enjoyed hearing about um, a subject I'm enormously passionate about. It really fires my heart and also about something you may not have known about beforehand in this sort of seismic shift during the 1960s in British glass design. I have a number of lectures covering both these areas and, and many more areas of 20th century decorative arts and antiques. And I would really love to be able to deliver them to you soon and, and, and meet you too. Thank you very much for listening to me and stay healthy and stay sane. Thank you.